Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Janice Kamina Resnick, and on behalf of Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, Inc., I warmly welcome you into our Zoom room tonight for our 74th consecutive week of America at a Crossroads virtual town hall series. Full unedited recordings of our past programs can be found on our YouTube channel and on our website. An easy to use link is provided in every single email that either David or I send. Tonight, we have the honor of hearing a preeminent Washington DC analyst and journalist, Susan Glasser, give her perspective on current events in conversation with the incomparable Pat Morrison. Our judge leadership team includes Mel Levine, David Lehrer, Zev Yaroslavsky, Caroline Kelly, and Rabbi Ken Chazen. You saw our list of co-sponsors on the screen a moment ago, and we are grateful to all of our co-sponsors. We have some great programs coming up. Next week, we will welcome the Wall Street Journal's White House reporter, Michael Bender, who wrote the highly acclaimed New York Times bestseller, Frankly, We Did Win This Election, The Inside Story. The following week is Rosh Hashanah, and for members of our audience who do not observe the holiday, or who would like to tune in after it's over, we will be replaying one of our former outstanding programs featuring Brett Stevens and Michelle Goldberg, both of the New York Times. On September 22nd, we hear from the always insightful David Frum, and then on September 29th, Jennifer Rubin will be returning for a program focusing on her analysis of how women's resistance saved our democracy. On October 6th, Senator Joe Manchin will be our guest, and on October 13th, we just added a new program, Dahlia Lithwick, the United States Supreme Court reporter for Slate and the always great UC Irvine School of Law professor Rick Hassan, who will be talking about abortion, guns, and voting right issues, which are on the US Supreme Court docket this year. Be sure to sign up early. Anyone who signs up after 4.30 before a program, I have to actually manually send you the Zoom link. So I would really appreciate early signups. And remember, if you unsubscribe from our list, you will not get the Zoom link. Um, that we send out twice in the 24 hours before each program. If you need to resubscribe because you're not getting our emails, just email me and I'll help you with that. David Lair is not able to be with us tonight, but he sends his warmest regards and welcome on behalf of Community Advocates, Inc. And now to begin tonight's program, please welcome the exceptional Pat Morrison. Pat writes for the LA Times and for many years in many different roles has hosted and moderated various radio and television programs. She has won six Emmys and six Golden Mike Awards and is loved by her readers and her audiences and by us at America at a Crossroads. Pat, take it away. Janice, thank you so much. 74 programs is extraordinary. So thanks to the board and all of those who are supporting this remarkable series. And we bring you tonight someone who, well, I can't think of a significant role in Washington journalism that Susan Glasser has not held. She's a staff writer at The New Yorker, as you heard, writing her weekly column about life in and from Washington. She's served most recently as the founder, co-founder of the award-winning Politico magazine, previously served as editor-in-chief of foreign policy, was an editor at the Washington Post, shared the job of Moscow bureau chief, and covered the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Her books include Kremlin Rising and The Man Who Ran Washington, both of which she co-wrote with her husband, Peter Baker. You'll be getting an opportunity to put your questions to her later in the hour. There's the Q&A box for that, and we hope you will do so as you listen to what she has to say. Susan, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much. It is really a great honor to be with you tonight, Pat and Janice. You know, you are an amazing force of nature. Thank you for having me back. I should note a historical footnote for this audience, which is to say that actually my husband Peter and I were supposed to be talking to this group on the night of January 6th of this year about our book. And needless to say, we had to cancel. And my guess is that all of you we're probably just watching the television with your jaws dropping, dropping open anyways. Uh, we did come back, I think, a couple weeks later to actually uh, have our time with this group. But I'm really honored to be back with you tonight and uh, hoping that something crazy doesn't happen while we're in the middle of this conversation. <laughs> Well, we will uh, we'll take up the topic of January 6th and some of the reverberations that it has had and will certainly still have for months to come. But I think what's uppermost in a lot of people's minds right now is Afghanistan. And you covered that war, you've written about it. And it always seemed to me like Schrodinger's cat, that no matter whether we left 10 years ago or 10 years from now, things were always going to go badly. So 
there are many ways to assess it, the military situation, the humanitarian situation, and the political strategizing situation. So maybe we can get a bite at each of those. Absolutely. I mean, look, it's been, uh, you know, just an overpowering story to watch in the last couple of weeks unfold. It was a, a breathtakingly fast collapse of the Afghan army and the state that we spent 20 years uh, working with. And the human cost is the one that I've really been focused on, uh, as well as, you know, what it means for the foreign policy of uh, Joe Biden, this is really his first foreign policy crisis. So, you know, you learn an awful lot in a crisis. They tend to clarify in Washington. Uh, forgive the interruption. That was my co-author, Ellie uh, Glasser, who is uh, a very helpful co-author, but not always so helpful when you're appearing on Zoom. We've, uh, we've, we've had appearances, unexpected surprise guests, we shall say, before, and this will not be the last time, I'm sure. So please go ahead. Can you? Are you oh, no, no. I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm good. Okay. So, so, so the collapse was quick. Was the intelligence inadequate? Uh, your the headline on your piece was Biden finally got to say no to the generals. He's been arguing for this for a very long time, and yet it still seems to have been kind of put together on the fly to a lot of people. Well, that's exactly right. It's a, it's it's a classic example. You can be too deterministic about it, I think. And some of the commentary in recent days has been, uh, I, I think, you know, almost a, a sense of hopelessness. Like, you know, in the in it's sort of the way that back in the 1990s, right? People sort of would say, well, they've been fighting with each other for centuries in the Balkans. You know, well, that still means there's still individual agency when it comes to destroying Sarajevo, a modern city that had very little to do with what happened in the 1400s. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that today. Afghanistan is, it's definitely true, is, is a war plagued country uh, that we have very little culturally in common with, that we, you know, managed to screw up uh, our own understanding of it over and over and over again. But it's also true that, um, you know, Joe Biden uh, made a decision in April of this year. And I think people seem to be really eager to, to relitigate the policy question of whether the US should keep its troops in Afghanistan after so long. Uh, and to me, that is a very different debate uh, than the question of what happened since April. Uh, and, you know, since April, the question is, was this withdrawal, uh, was it organized in the right way? Was there, as you pointed out, Pat, was there the correct kind of intelligence? Did they make assumptions that were flawed assumptions, uh, either based on flawed intelligence or because they didn't really want to acknowledge uh, this as a realistic pos possibility, which obviously the collapse of the government was a realistic policy possibility since it happened. So, you know, in my view, there's the issue of the policy question of what are the US national interests remaining in Afghanistan. And, you know, I, I have seen this tragedy unfold over the whole 20 years. I was there back in 2001, uh, a very accidental, I must say, war correspondent, uh, never heard a gunfire in my life uh, before I ended up covering the Battle of Tora Bora. But, you know, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Definitely Donald Trump. Uh, they're all authors in many ways of uh, you know, the American engagement and the American failures in Afghanistan. And then there's the question of, of Joe Biden, both, you know, how should we assess his performance since April? Uh, and you know, what is history going to make of it? And the jury, by the way, is still out on that. Also, it's a game of numbers. How many refugees are getting out? How many Americans are getting out? Um, we see mixed messages, it seems, coming from the Republicans. You see some Republicans saying, well, we have to support the people who fought with us and for us in Afghanistan, but don't bring any refugees over here. And to that end, how many are too many? How many are too few? And if we leave a single American in Afghanistan who doesn't want to be there, is that going to be all that we're going to be hearing until the 2022 and 2024 elections? Well, there's so much to unpack here. Uh, you know, let me let me just start by making a few observations. First of all, uh, there are an enormous number of people who helped the United States military directly, to who helped the U.S. government, or who helped civil society, NGOs, women and girls, education, news media outlets. Uh, some estimates suggest that's at least 300,000 Afghans. And that seems about right to me, if not too low, based on the figure of 20 years. So we are obviously not going to be airlifting 300,000 Americans out. And in fact, what's about to start happening because President Biden has made the decision to stick 
with the August 31st withdrawal date, uh, they need time to draw down the 6,000 U.S. troops who they had to surge back into the country to, to make it safe to do this airlift from Kabul. And so they're going to actually start doing that soon. So the, the, the numbers of Afghans who get out are going to start to come down and American citizens. Uh, really, there's only a day or two more for people to get out. So this is ending. It's a remarkable accomplishment because they were not prepared fully and they were caught flat footed. So on the one hand, you can look at this and you can say, wow, you know, 70,000 people have been gotten out of the country. That's incredible. The US military is, is probably the only military in the world that could do something like this. They have incredible capacity. Uh, the flip side is our civilian institutions, the State Department, the Department of Ham Homeland Security. It's not clear what's gonna happen to these people in part because of what you mentioned, Pat, which is the question of, how are we going to accept these people? The last few years, the Trump administration essentially gutted uh, the uh, refugee policy in this country, gutted the political asylum uh, policy. They basically took that number down to zero. Uh, one of the reasons the Biden administration says they weren't prepared fully to uh, even process the special immigrant visa application holders uh, or app applicants from Afghanistan before this emergency is because they say there was a backlog of 19,000 applicants that the Trump administration had just been sitting on in the last year of its tenure. So any disaster, right? It's a confluence of so many different things. But you know, I, I, I will tell this audience uh, tonight something I haven't talked about yet personally, but my interpreter and fixer from the Battle of Tora Bora all those years ago reached out to me just a few days ago uh, and through a series of, you know, remarkable uh, twists and turns and, you know, the, the accident of fate, essentially, that we've all read about in, in World War II, in so many other conflicts up to our present day, uh, this guy and his family, he's now a doctor, he was a medical student at the time, he helped me, uh, managed not only to make it to Kabul from the city where he lived, managed to make it to the airport with a, a group of other people, and was airlifted out of the country uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. This is a miracle. I tell you this story because it's an exception, not the rule. The, the numbers game is, is really not on our side. And, and again, I know it's a remarkable logistical accomplishment. Uh, I've talked with people who are doing it. it it's really, really impressive to me. But um, the bottom line is it's, it's not necessarily something uh, that we, we'll look back on as this great success. And I was really surprised actually to hear the White House press secretary from the podium uh, yesterday saying, well, of course, this is this huge success. I mean, a, a little moment to step back and to say, you know, the, the incredible tragedy that's unfolding here, it has many authors, uh, but I wish our politics weren't so poisonous that we couldn't acknowledge that no, not all of the Afghans whose lives are at risk because they helped America, we are not going to be getting them out. It's just not gonna happen. You know, Winston Churchill was able to turn Dunkirk into a moral victory. Is there any chance that Biden anticipating just this kind of attack that you talk about can do the same? Well, you know, look, Winston Churchill, uh, uh, first of all, you know, was appointed prime minister, I believe like a week before uh, Dunkirk happened. And, you know, he was very, immersed in the ways of war. And he said something very wise that I think we would be well to remember, which is to say uh, a, an evacuation, no matter how successful, is not a synonym for victory. Uh, and, and that's something else. And uh, you know, I think that, again, it's never too late to do the right thing. It's never too late. And I think that the Biden administration has shown us that because they were caught flat-footed. They were clearly distressed. Uh, and upset at what the collapse of the government that they had mistakenly thought would hold out longer. They didn't spend you know, their time sitting around crying about it. They've organized this evacuation. It's remarkable what they have done, uh, but they're not gonna be judged just on the basis of how many they got out, but on how many left behind, on some unknowns, like what is the counterterrorism risk that we now face as a result of deciding to withdraw the American presence? Those are all things that we don't know the answer to yet. In April, President Biden said that uh, he believed the terrorism threat was significantly reduced 
from the physical territory of Afghanistan itself, and that he was going to withdraw from Afghanistan, but he was going to have a new policy of negotiating bases in the region so that we could be uh, you know, ready at a minute's notice to deal with any threat from Al Qaeda or ISIS that might emerge. Well, now the National Security Advisor says, actually, the threat from ISIS and Al Qaeda have grown very significantly in the last few days. And so, again, we just don't know the answer. Um, but looking to 9-11 in just a couple of weeks and the 20th anniversary, I, I just, how is it going to feel to us to see the Taliban flag flying over uh, the U.S. Embassy? Uh, let's talk then now about COVID and the rise of infections and death, principally in parts of the country that we could call the Old South, I guess. And Donald Trump, when he advised a crowd at a rally in Alabama to get vaccinated, he was booed. Donald Trump. And you've written about the grim new math of the coronavirus for Red America, why the GOP is now finally coming around to recommend the vaccines and what maybe what cynicism, what sense of reality is uh, coming front and center in the Republican leadership's vision that this is happening and whether it's going to be a success. You know, there's so much to unpack there. It's, it's so hard, right, that we're having this conversation so long into the pandemic at a time when, unlike at the beginning, uh, you know, there is uh, a solution and a prevention to these deaths. And for, for many people, it's, it's, it's politics and partisan loyalty alone that has caused them from doing something that would have saved their own lives and the lives of other people. It, it's just, it's an almost an unimaginable tragedy, except of course it is imaginable. And by the way, I do think that's the connection between the conversation we're just having about Afghanistan and the conversation now about the pandemic and the, the internal crisis in the United States. I, I do believe that the biggest national security threat right now to the United States is, is here inside our own borders, uh, you know, and the, the geopolitical instability is also the question of what kind of uh, America we're going to be as, as the world's largest power, but also struggling so much. And, you know, a country that can't talk to each other, uh, that is becoming more and more divided rather than less and less. I mean, one thing that the, the rise of this fourth wave of the pandemic, I think, unfortunately tells us is that it's not, it wasn't enough just for Donald Trump to leave office uh, and to not be president anymore in terms of having a president who's not speaking in divisive terms, who's seeking reconciliation. That has been a shift, a radical and positive shift in tone from Trump to Biden, but it hasn't overcome those divisions. And if anything, people's willingness uh, to take that tribalism to take risks with their own lives. I think it's been really, for me as an observer, uh, a very painful thing to watch in the last six months. To see it play out is horrific. Uh, to read day in and day out about you know, the lack of uh, hospital beds and ICU uh, resources and ventilators in you know, Arkansas and Alabama and Mississippi, you know, places where the vaccination rate is 36%, I think, right now. Uh, you know, we're not only a rich country, we have enough vaccine for every single person in the country. The rest of the world is begging and clamoring for the vaccines that half of our country is turning up their noses at. You, you wrote that he, he, Biden, intended to vaccinate the country, but he couldn't vaccinate it against Fox News. Yeah, you know, it's again, it's just um, the toxicity of the political culture obviously is, is intimately related right now in Washington to the toxicity of uh, you know, the, the media ecosphere surrounding the Republican Party. And I think it does have a lot to do with its transformation in the last decade and its, its radicalization. Uh, and it has um, been really interesting to watch just this week, right? We got really good news, it seems to me, with the uh, decision by the FDA to grant not just emergency youth use authorization for the Pfizer vaccine, but to say, you know, this is just overall approval. That will now trigger, hopefully, a, a new round of vaccine mandates and companies and state and local governments and schools requiring it. And yet, you know, if you watch the Fox News commentary, what did you see? You saw, uh, on the one hand, okay, well, why did they, uh, you know, uh, take so long to do this? Then as soon as it was approved, they said, well, wait a minute, uh, you know, this is really a rushed approval process. I mean, how can we trust it? And 
you know, if, if, if your business model is to rely on convincing people that untrue things are true and that they shouldn't do things uh, to protect themselves. I mean, this is the same channel that's been peddling, you know, medical misinformation throughout the pandemic, that hydroxychloroquine, uh, you know, that was a, a made for uh, Fox TV special, uh, courtesy of Sean Hannity and friends. And of course, at the same time, as we've been reading, Fox is requiring its own employees to mask up and in some cases get vaccinated. Look, I mean, you know, hypocrisy uh, has always been in abundance, uh, you know, in our political culture or any other. Uh, it's just that in this super saturated media world, I think we're exposed to it at, at levels that, uh, you know, uh, almost blow the mind. Uh, and that seems to be, you know, a new strategy in politics compared with when I first started you know, covering Washington and writing about it. It's not that politicians were uh, any more pure or uh, less hypocritical uh, back in the day, but uh, we were not as overwhelmed with so much information. So we had time to chew over their misdeeds a little bit more, it seems to me, than we do now. What are the consequences if the Republicans start telling their base to get vaccinated and the base says no? Is this a crack? Is it a breach? Is it going to cost the Republicans anything? <laughs> Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I'm sure you noticed the other night that Trump uh, had a rally, uh, one of his few public appearances, actually, since he left the White House. And he was booed by some people in the audience when he pointed out that he himself had taken the vaccine and, um, you know, said that they should do so as well. Uh, you know, and he's afraid of having the base turn against him, which is a lot of the reason why he never made a public service announcement. Uh, in the months when it would have mattered and perhaps prevented this fourth wave. He never put any of his prestige and credibility on the line, it seems to me, to sell this vaccine for exactly that reason. He's so addicted to the applause and cheers of his crowd that he's very, very reluctant to do anything. And I think that helps to explain not just Trump, but a lot of the Republican politicians who know damn well that this is killing people and have not spoken out because they're afraid to use one ounce of their own credibility uh, in the other direction. Now, whatever you think of Mitch McConnell, my guess is this crowd doesn't think very much of Mitch McConnell. He is one of the people um, who from the very beginning was very adamant about uh, the vaccine uh, and was willing to, in fact, use, uh, I think, a few million dollars from his campaign fund in, in the last couple of months to even air advertisements in his home state of Kentucky, which is a state with unfortunately a very terrible and low rate of uh, vaccines uh, to push it. So, you know, I, I don't want to paint an overly broad brush. Uh, there is a subset of this country uh, and of the Trump base that has been hyper activated around this vaccine issue. It's not all Republicans. In fact, I believe a majority of Republicans uh, have received a vaccine according to the most recent polls. It's just way, way lower uh, than those who have any other political affiliation in the country. Um, there's, of course, the whole process of the um, rebuilding package, the infrastructure package is going through. There's talk about reconciliation. There was debate over the summer about the filibuster. So before you get into the weeds on the mechanics, we remember that Mitch McConnell famously said that his goal as the head of the Senate was to see that Barack Obama was a one-term president. So. As you talked about in what you had written, there's the Biden border crisis, the crime crisis, the inflation crisis, all being put at Biden's feet. Can you size up the state of work on Capitol Hill vis-a-vis -vis itself and the president? And please forgive me one minute while I pop out this pesky contact lens. So please go ahead, Susan. <laughs> Thank you so much. Listen, I would say that uh, you know it's not pretty to watch Congress uh, trying to do its job, especially because it really hasn't done its job in recent years very well. And, you know, I started out as a young reporter on Capitol Hill when I graduated from college. I'm embarrassed to say how long ago, uh, but, you know, let's just say that the 1990s, uh, you know, uh, were certainly a partisan period, but they did a lot more business in Congress. And there was much more of uh, an equilibrium and a balance of power uh, between the two branches of government, the, the Congress and the executive than there is uh, now. You know, people might not realize this, but Congress, its most fundamental responsibility is to pass 12 annual appropriations bills. Hasn't done it a single time, I think, since, uh, you know, maybe once in the Obama presidency, but basically since the George W. Bush presidency. I mean, it, it's broken down, essentially. And uh, Mitch McConnell is basically 
been really, really good as a majority leader and a minority leader in the Senate at doing one thing, which is stopping legislation as opposed to passing legislation. And so, you know, that's the context, I think, uh, for Ken Biden, who is a creature of the U.S. Senate, who basically spent, I think, 34 years in the Senate, his entire adult working life, essentially, before he became vice president with Obama. Uh, he comes from a world where they used to pass bills and make deals. And I think he's recognizing it's a long shot. There, this is very interesting to watch this bipartisan infrastructure bill pass the Senate and make its way into the House. And the politics of that for Democrats, who you know essentially have this much bigger, more sweeping agenda that they now look to pass with purely Democratic votes only. But yet there's still going to be this bipartisan bill. Why would Mitch McConnell vote for that? That's such an interesting question. And I think it's the point at which, especially after four years of Trump, even a subset of Republicans, and we now know how many, by the way, the answer is 19 Senate Republicans, not all Republicans, 19 Senate Republicans still think the voters would like them to show that they can do something mm. other than talk on Fox News. But it's not headed in their direction. A lot of the people who voted for that bill of, of the Republicans are Republicans whose average age is probably like 75 or 80. Uh, they are, you know, a number of retiring senators who will no longer face their voters uh, or people who might retire in the future like McConnell. And so it's not the future weight of the party. All of the young aspiring leaders in the Senate, in the Republican Party, they're all against even that kind of relatively modest uh, bipartisan deal. So not so much broken, at least in the Senate, is sabotaged. Well, uh, I think it shows you again that the, just the definition of what that job even is uh, of a senator or a member of the House has changed fundamentally. And they no longer see their incentive and their reward structure to be to actually get something done in Washington. Uh, their, their job, as they define it, is different than you and I might define it. Their job, you know, is to raise money, is to talk on Fox, is to keep the base in a permanent state of agitation and unhappiness and fear. And what about over in the House, where Biden has to contend not only with concerns about keeping a majority in 2022, but he has um, figures in the party, important figures in, in Congress, like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who are wanting much more liberal policies than the Biden administration has been pushing up to a point. And the question whether some of those policies become self-defeating in the decisions that the Biden White House, as well as the House leadership has to make. Well, look, I mean, first of all, if they do actually succeed in passing this $3.5 trillion uh, 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 budget reconciliation bill, I, it would be remarkable uh, if the party's progressive wing uh, was, you know, still complaining about Biden. I mean, you know, really the question there, it seems to me, is a political question of uh, will the Democrats have gone too far and, you know, will even moderate Republicans or independents, the kind of people who broke from the Republican Party uh, and voted against Trump, will they think that that's too much and a turn too far to the left? So, you know, if, if they were going to say that that $3.5 trillion bill uh, was not left enough uh, and that the Biden uh, was the sort of moderate centrist of their nightmares, that would be uh, really something because I think the political question is going to be in the other direction. The midterm elections, I cannot say enough, they do not structurally favor the Democrats at all. It's a huge risk factor. Uh, and I think that it's, it's informing the Biden White House's calculations about why they're willing to do something so potentially politically risky. Uh, we have redistricting. That alone could cost Democrats something like three to five seats, and they don't have three to five seats to spare. Uh, you know, the uh, historic averages in a midterm of a president's first four years, uh, you know, goes against the party. And as it is, uh, Nancy Pelosi can only afford to lose only three Democrats from her party on any single vote. That basically has already made the House of Representatives fundamentally ungovernable. Uh, any caucus of, uh, you know, more than like four or five people, you basically can control the outcome of any vote. And you saw mm -hmm. that earlier this week uh, with uh, Josh Gottheimer and his problem solvers group of just nine people. They were able to hold the House up for a large number of days, back when I started out covering progress, nine people could not hold up 
uh, a vote on, uh, on the floor of the House. Uh, that is a very small number indeed if you have to negotiate with every group of nine people. I remember when uh, leadership of both parties would meet out punishment to, uh, to renegade members who would pull stunts like that. Well, you know, one thing that's interesting is that in the last few years on the Republican side, you know, you really saw this emerging with the Tea Party caucus, who was very, very anti uh, the leadership of their own party. That then morphed into something called the House Freedom Caucus among Republicans. And, and then in some ways, they went from being a fringe group to essentially gobbling up the whole. And so now the whole House Republican conference essentially is made up of the Freedom Caucus or supporters like it. The Trump administration, uh, very interestingly, two of Donald Trump's four White House chiefs of staff were members, founding members of the House Freedom Caucus, which uh, John Boehner, the former Republican speaker, in his recent memoir, which was a, a very entertaining read, I, I must recommend it to you if you're interested in- you Drink it I, with a cocktail in your hand, or you read it has, with a cocktail in your hand. Or you can listen to it on the audiobook. He, he actually reads uh, some of it himself, uh, including some ad-lib attacks on Ted Cruz. But John Boehner called the Freedom Caucus, he called them political terrorists and legislative terrorists. Well, who, was he, who did he mean? Mark Meadows, who then became the chief of staff to Donald Trump, Mick Mulvaney, the previous chief of staff to Donald Trump. Let's talk about other events on Capitol Hill, the ones that kept you and your husband from us on January 6th. There has been formation of a commission, but not a bipartisan commission. The Republicans who held countless hearings into what happened in Benghazi are refusing to convene the equivalent of a 9-11 commission to find out what happened on January 6th. Um, even attacking astonishingly to hear men and women in uniform, the Capitol Police. The FBI just found there was little evidence that this was coordinated. The Secret Service just, it just turned out, in fact, Politico found this out, that the Secret Service had warned the Capitol Police the day before that something of this magnitude might happen. We hear Republicans say, let's just move on. Let's just forget about it. This. It, it, it's almost shocking and hard to take in in its magnitude, the idea that an attack on the Capitol would be something so negligible in the eyes of so many leaders of this country. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, you, you summed it up pretty well. Um, that, I think, has informed all my thinking uh, about the politics of this moment. And I think that in some ways, it's a reality that's so disturbing uh, th that we've somehow gotten used to. Um, every time I try to understand something that seems almost incomprehensible in politics today. I take a breath actually, and I remember 140 Republican members of Congress voted against certifying the election results and against the legitimacy of Biden's victory as president hours after the January 6th attack on their own Capitol, okay? And even at the time I understood uh, that this was probably the most significant vote I'd ever seen uh, in Congress. And I really believe that because that, that's, that to me, remember that that was a fantasy. There was literally no legitimate reason to do so. It's not that there was an election contest being held. Uh, you know, 50 courts had thrown this out. There actually was no legitimate reason to have that vote, except that Donald Trump wanted those members of Congress to vote in that way. And so, even at the time, as horrific as the mob attack itself was on the Capitol, in the end, right, you know, they weren't an invading army, they weren't going to seize the Capitol. Uh, it was the fact that 140 members of Congress chose to go along with, and that's two thirds of the House Republican Conference, by the way, along with seven Republican senators. Um, the fact that they chose to go along with it, just literally, uh, you know, stepping over broken glass to get there. Um, I think that that's a moment we're all gonna look back on as a very significant moment in our history. And I would like to say uh, so many times that the crisis is over, uh, but remember that that's who's in our government right now. Uh, and you, you realize that the crisis is not over. You mentioned redistricting, but we're also seeing in addition to that, which we see every 10 years, um, these voter suppression measures across the nation, Democrats in the Texas legislature, 
got out of town in order to try to stop these measures from moving forward. State after state with Republican controlled legislatures, we see people who have contested the legitimacy of the presidential vote and other votes now using legislative means just to stop people from voting in the first place. People who voted legitimately in the last election and the election before that and the one before that. This may be on its own scale as worrying as what you talked about, about the vote on the floor of Congress, Congress not to certify the election results. Yes, I think it's an extremely uh, worrisome development. And, you know, I, I just, I spent some time earlier this year uh, reading back as some of the history of the civil rights movement uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. And what's stunning is if you, you know, sort of take a, a minute away from the current headlines, and you, you go back and look at some of the rhetoric after the Brown versus Board of Education decision, uh, some of the things, the, the rallying cries of you know, segregation now and segregation forever, the ways in which uh, the governors uh, and uh, local and state leaders throughout the South uh, talked about voting rights, talked about uh, resistance, massive resistance. Uh, these are things that are very, very, um, resonant, unfortunately, with this current wave and campaign, uh, not exclusively, but largely in the states of the South that uh, restricted Black voting rights, restricted Blacks access to education, uh, and, you know, imposed horrific segregation in this country. These, this is happening in the same place. They're using the same rhetoric, and it's, it's, it's really shocking to anybody who has I think looked at the history of it at all. And when you, when you look at Capitol Hill, you see the patterns there being replicated. That that forces are being pushed farther and farther to the extremes. In the electoral college and the electoral system, you may wind up with extremes of what we see now, where we have a state with a couple of million voters, most of which may be Republicans, voting equally because of the two vote in the Senate rule, with states with a lot of blue. Um, Republican or blue Democratic voters that are also voters of color, at some point people are going to really be angry about the de disequilibrium of this system more so than they are now. And what could the consequences of that be and can it, would it be remedied? Well, you know, Pat, I think you're right because that is one big difference from uh, the 1960s, which is ultimately actually one of the, the, the things that happened that, that moved the country past uh, the, gr the gridlock of uh, the segregation system was that the federal government and federal institutions kicked in, right? And you had the United States Supreme Court making a series of historic decisions and they were transformed over time by appointees uh, of FDR and other democratic presidents. And you had also not just the judiciary, but you had the executive branch transforming and it was the justice department, the federal uh, uh, government essentially that came, started to come up with solutions and the Justice Department that created, uh, you know, an enforcement division, uh, civil rights division. Uh, you had Congress, the federal Congress, passing laws like a series of voting rights acts, a uh, series of civil rights acts. And now, because of the problem that you just alluded to, we have this gridlock in our federal institutions, uh, you know, that's not able to come up with a, a, a solution, I think right now, that would be accepted uh, to uh, this. And we've never had federal uh, uh, voting laws and the Supreme Court has made it very clear. I mean, in fact, they triggered this whole round of restrictions on voting rights with this decision authored by Chief Justice John Roberts who remains there uh, you know, a few years ago. And so this is- the undercutting, undercutting the, the mechanics of the Voting Rights Act. Absolutely, that decision, which is really what's set in wave, this whole motion, uh, sorry, this whole wave of um, laws. First of all, it predates Donald Trump. It predates the 2020 election. And what it was, was it said, oh, actually the South essentially has graduated uh, from the need to have the Justice Department oversee uh, its, its elections because of historic discrimination against blacks. So this decision basically said like, oh, good job guys, we're done. And of course the result was what we're seeing here and, and history is never over. And every generation, unfortunately, uh, is called to the fight in a different way. And I think that's what we're seeing. 
I want to get to some of the questions people are putting in. I'll put one last question to you, though. And we we see from the tone of the Trump campaign, I alone can fix it. And now we see with Biden in the White House, he would like to be a kind of FDR, a kind of massive change agent, because it seems like half measures aren't going to do much of anything in this country anymore. And so his reach is big and it's wide. But what is your sense of what you call the persuadability when it comes down to the practicalities? You're getting new bridges, you're getting new schools, you're getting new hospitals, you're getting broadband internet. You know, what's, what's, what's worrisome to me is that we could uh, hand out a lot of broadband internet uh, to areas that don't have it. We could fix up a bunch of bridges. We could fix up a bunch of airports. Uh, we can invent a miraculous vaccine uh, in a short period of time. Uh, and you know, people might drive over the bridge. They might even take that vaccine, uh, but they may still carry with them, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of a toxic partisanship that that won't let them move on from this state of gridlock. And of course, the big difference between Joe Biden and FDR uh, or LBJ, for that matter, another Democratic president with transformative ambitions, is uh, he doesn't have the majorities in Congress. Uh, that can enable him to enact that legislation in a way uh, that will feel like there's a national consensus behind it. And, you know, Nancy Pelosi has three votes to spare in the Senate. Not even that. We're talking about a 50-50 Senate, which is a very, very rare thing indeed. And so, you know, you can't really be FDR in a practical political sense with a 50-50 United States Senate. Here's a question from Mark about Pelosi asking whether she's contributed to the division uh, that Biden wanted to heal in his speech. This is something that we hear a great deal about is Pelosi's role. Well, you know, look, very much you could say that Nancy Pelosi is, is a very powerful speaker. You know, there are some speakers of the House, uh, you know, who really wield the authority of the office. There are others who come and go more quickly. Nancy Pelosi has been a very, very effective speaker of the House. She She's a real power broker, uh, and she uh, is very strong. She's kept her conference together in a remarkable way throughout, uh, you know, a lot of the tribulations of the Trump era. Uh, but in a partisan time, you don't do that without being very partisan yourself. Uh, and if anything, the fact that she has such a narrow majority right now I think it's pushing her to become an even more partisan figure. Uh, so, you know, we could spend forever, uh, you know, on watching people argue whether, you know, the, sort of the chicken or the egg here, you know, <laughs> who, who was more partisan first? Uh, but I think it's fair to say that she is a very partisan figure. Mike uh, wants to know about the motivation, and you touched on this, of those in Congress who are so obstructionist, mostly Republican, but he says some extremists in the Democratic Party. And don't they understand democracy or don't they care? Are they willing to have it fail in favor of an authoritarian regime? Well, let's not hope the choice you know, comes so directly to that. And, and I think part of the problem and part of the way we've slid into this crisis of democracy, it seems to me, is because it's rare that you just get a moment. Uh, you know, If you stuck a truth serum in, in front of a member of Congress and you said, you know, this is your choice, whether to, you know, obstruct this bill or to slide into an autocracy, they'd probably pick democracy, at least I hope they would. Uh, but, you know, they always rationalize it. There's always, well, it's just one vote, it's just this, or it's my priority. Uh, the bottom line is Congress has been breaking down for some time. Again, that predates, I would say, Donald Trump. Uh, he certainly was a, you know, pick your metaphor, accelerant, uh, you know, of the fire. But, uh, you know, there was a very, I think, important work done by a couple of friends of mine, Tom Mann of the Brookings Institution and Norm Ornstein of AEI. And this was back at the very beginning of the Obama era. And they wrote about something they called asymmetric polarization in uh, the, the Congress. And essentially, it was stop doing the things that it was supposed to do. Like I mentioned, the appropriations bills. It just stopped doing its work. It, the gridlock took over. Uh, and they point figures pretty clearly at the Republican Party. I think part of that is ideological. Why? There has been a pretty systematic assault uh, as a matter of party principle on the basic idea of government and governance uh, ever since Ronald Reagan you know, got up there and gave a speech and said, essentially, uh, government is the enemy uh, and not the solution. And from perhaps being a corrective in some ways to you know, some of the problems uh, that, that did exist 
in the executive branch, it's become an ideology in and of itself. Uh, and, and the means to the end has been destroying government uh, and getting rid of regulations. Uh, and you know that's a negative agenda in some ways. And I think that that has become a cohesive uh, worldview uh, for many of the Republicans who enter politics, who enter elective office. And that makes them a very, very different cohort and one much less likely to come up with deals or to want to agree on legislation because they see their mission in radically different terms than Democrats who tend to come. It's, it's you know, a classic big tent. Uh, there's different issues, there's different coalitions, but basically it's a lot of people who do believe in government and who see themselves as problem solvers or wanting uh, to, you know, make government work in some way. And I, those have become more and more at odds with each other in the in the Washington that I live in. Uh, Mark in Short Hills, New Jersey wants to know how the public will regard the governor of Florida, the governor of Texas for their policies about the pandemic. Just today, the governor of Texas said, we will not have any uh, vaccine mandates. Yeah, I know. I was reading that executive order and it's really, forgive me, I have something in my head. It's really striking actually, to see um, Governor Abbott, you know, literally waiving Texas's public health laws uh, by executive decree to make sure that nobody mandates the use of a vaccine that has been approved by the federal Food and Drug Administration. It's, it's really a remarkable moment where politics has come to the point that you have elected officials overruling doctors and public health officials on something uh, at when in the middle of a huge spike in cases where their hospitals are overrun. DeSantis and Abbott have made a very calculated political bet. And that's what's kind of amazing to me is that they actually think this is gonna benefit them uh, even if it kills off a whole bunch of their constituents. Um, if that's not the height of cynicism, you know, I don't know what is. Um, there's a question from Lauren that I'll kind of paraphrase regarding the Afghan evacuation, which you referred to as a remarkable accomplishment. But what about the rest of the world's regard for Biden and his foreign policy team and how that's going to be tested? We remember how badly Donald uh, Trump was regarded by our allies and with, uh, with suspicion by much of the rest of the world. And the Biden administration was something of a relief. How is that playing now? And will the fate of Afghanistan really be the tiller on the Biden administration's foreign policy and how it's perceived? You know, I, I'm glad that you asked that question, actually, because it, it's, it really, it has been a revealing crisis in the sense of Biden and the allies. And, you know, they really have pushed back uh, and felt very bruised by this. Uh, you know, they, they have been, there have been enormous public complaints uh, in some of our closest allies, the people who were the most relieved to have Joe Biden as president and not Donald Trump, uh, you know, in Germany, in the UK, uh, you know, they, they practically wept, uh, you know, and cheered on inauguration day, January 20th, uh, at the change over Biden played to them. He said, not only is America back in the world, but particularly, you know, I'm going to be the kind of president who tends to our alliances. Back in April, when he made the decision to withdraw the troops and announced it, there were many bruised feelings in, in, in those capitals uh, and a sense that Biden had not done what he promised to do just a month, you know, a couple of months before, that Biden had not consulted with him, them, that it was really policy by diktat once again, an American unilateralism, although soldiers uh, and, you know, other personnel from those countries had fought alongside the Americans for the whole 20 years. It's the only time, in fact, in NATO's entire history when Article 5, that's the famous self-defense all for one, one for all uh, uh, part of the NATO treaty, the only time it was ever invoked was to go with the United States into Afghanistan after 9-11. And so to not consult uh, really, but more to inform the allies that this decision had been made, that was already a bruised feeling. And then when the government collapsed so quickly, uh, you know, these allies in the last few days, they've been pleading with more time. They had a meeting just yesterday with Biden, an emergency session of the G7. The leaders asked Biden at that meeting for more time for the evacuation. And that, you know, pointed out that that August 31st deadline was just an 
an arbitrary deadline that Biden himself had set. So why couldn't he, you know, extend it? Uh, and he refused. So it is, I think, an early and bad signal to send to the allies. Um, you know, I would say that, you know, it's they don't have anywhere else to go. Uh, and they're probably overall still going to be happier with Biden's foreign policy than that of Donald Trump's. But uh, I think that they're under no illusion that America is, is the partner that they want it to be at this point. Here's a specific question in a larger setting. The specific question is, do you think that a $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill will be passed? But then apropos of that, Stan wants to know, with that sense of urgency, with 2022 ahead, why can't Democrats just go ahead and pass the infrastructure bill in the House now before the bigger uh, bill negotiations fall apart? He says Biden needs this win right now. Well, I think there's a lot of people who agree uh, with the assumption embedded in that. However, Nancy Pelosi is not one of those people. Uh, and you know, to keep her conference together, I think Pat's question was right on the mark from earlier in our conversation. Um, those progressives in the House who really are a very large block at this point of the House Democratic Caucus, they're not going for the bipartisan infrastructure bill without the bigger $3.5 trillion package. And so Pelosi essentially has no choice. Uh, she has to uh, say that those two bills are linked. There's no way for her to cut loose that infrastructure bill. Things will maybe then get a little bit more interesting in the Senate uh, where they just uh, they might not have the votes. It's not clear, uh, you know, that they can get Joe Manchin, who's going to be, I guess, a guest uh, in this uh, in this excellent conversation series in a few weeks. Uh, it's not clear that they can get Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema to go along with that massive three point five trillion dollar package. And so, in that case, uh, we may well come right back to the question of can't they just pass the infrastructure bill, bill alone? Barbara asks, and I'll put this in a bigger context for you too, about the Supreme Court ruling on the Trump policy, keeping asylum seekers in Mexico until their case is heard, which could be many years, and they're already living in squatters camps along the border. But this is a larger part of the Trump legacy, like sticky traps. How much of the Biden administration's wish to move forward is going to be stuck with some of these Trump policies and Trump administrative decisions that may go to the Supreme Court? Yeah, I mean, the answer is it could quite be be a lot in particular, as you know, on immigration and everything having to do with uh, 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 migration and refugees and immigrants. Uh, this was a huge focus and the border. Uh, this was a huge focus of the Trump administration and they were looking uh, essentially to put uh, sand in the machinery and to make it as hard as possible to undo uh, what they had done. And, you know, given how long it takes legislation to wake its way through our system, uh, if there's just one four-year term of the Biden administration, it may well uh, outlast Biden, uh, some of this Trump legacy in this area. In other areas, by the way, Biden has chosen to leave in place uh, some aspects of Trump's policy. For example, uh, Trump's extreme uh, uh, economic nationalism and his, his fondness for tariffs, uh, which, which before Trump had been widely rejected by economists in both parties uh, and not seen as a viable tool at all of economic statecraft. Amazingly enough, you know, we're already in August of uh, Biden's first year. He has not gotten rid of Trump's tariffs. Uh, I think that's really notable. Uh, he did not rejoin the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the trade deal that the Obama-Biden administration had negotiated as a key part of our strategy to counter China in the region. Uh, you know, and so there's a sense that I don't know, you know, that the politics have moved in some way that's led him to keep some of those Trump economic policies in place, at least for now. Uh, there are some foreign policy issues as well, where he has kept some of uh, Trump's policies in place, even though he wouldn't have done them himself. This is a frequent question that we get, and maybe you've got a quick answer for it before we give you the big wrap up. And it's Jerry from LA wanting to know with all the investigations going on at so many levels, is Trump ever going to be tried and or convicted of anything? And he includes state investigations, which seem to be going apace. Well, uh, you know, I would say after the last few years, if it's taught us anything, it's, uh, you know, don't bet on there being one transformative, like, you know, sweeping moment when Donald Trump, you know, faces, uh, you know, his past. Uh, and can't escape it. Um, you know, I know that there's been, I think I wrote a column about the, the persistent fantasy 
of uh, that moment. And, you know, this idea that someday, somehow, we're going to see Donald Trump in an orange jumpsuit, you know, and handcuffs being taken away by men in, in you know, FBI jackets. Well, there have been... There's been a lot of photoshopping of that, which may be as close as it ever gets to it. Exactly. You know, it's like when when people say, as they did again this week, like, don't, you know, don't be, don't bet against Nancy Pelosi. Uh, you know, look, Donald Trump, I mean, the guy clearly has more than nine lives, right? Um, <laughs> so, you know, don't bet on the FBI taking him away in an orange jumpsuit. So let's let you have a last couple of minutes, Susan, talking about how the landscape looks to you as we move ahead, as time makes us move ahead. We have no choice in the matter. And, and what it is that we can salvage out of this that looks hopeful and what people, what can make people feel like they have the power to do? You know, I, I, I got to admit, Pat, this has been a fantastic conversation, but I've been sort of dreading this uh, uh, <laughs> because I was given strict instructions that I was supposed to end on an upbeat note. <laughs> uh oh. So, Okay, how can we do that? Look, I will say that actually, uh, you know, it, it's a little bit trite, but you know, every generation does have to make its own, uh, you know, uh, fight for whatever this their definition of this country is going to be. Uh, and I think that you know, in the renewal of activism, in the sense that you know, certain things with pre which previous generations just absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, had come to accept, even if they knew that it was unacceptable. I feel like the changing of, of boundaries and the renewal of activism and of a passionate new generation uh, uh, of people in this country who are not going to just sit back and, and, and accept the unacceptable anymore, uh, you know, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it is uh, uh, the Time's Up and, the, you know, the, the idea that, you um, you know, women are not just going to, you know, say, okay, well, there's nothing we can do uh, about these things in our workplace anymore. I mean, these are the signs of a kind of engagement, of civic re-engagement of community that I think do give us hope at a moment when the democracy is in such crisis, we're going to need that activism uh, to make sure that it survives. And then, you know, I just, I, Anna, again, to take it on a maybe overly personal note, it has been really remarkable uh, to me to see, you know, it's hidden, I know, to most Americans, that the war in Afghanistan, the, the entire 20 year disastrous global war on terror, you know, partially it existed because it was kind of hidden from the majority of Americans. Uh, but I just want to tell those of you who, you know, might not be aware of it, you know, seeing how much people who did have some engagement with Afghanistan, whether it was people in the military or people in the, you know, the US government here in Washington, the, the NGOs, uh, people, you know, who worked to build the American University of Afghanistan, who I know, mm -hmm. journalists, most of the journalists I know at one point or another circled through, seeing them organize and feel responsible in a way has been a reminder that it's never too late to do the right thing. It's never too late to care. Let's hope we can bring that message home. Susan Glasser, thank you so much. Everyone will agree you were more than worth waiting for since we didn't get you on January 6th. We do want to remind you that September 1st, next Wednesday, Wall Street Journal's Michael Bender will be here in conversation with Warren Olney. Thank you all for registering. Coming, Come as early as possible for the next events. You will be getting links in the email to follow up on this program and, of course, uh, to let us know what you think of what we have been doing and what we ought to be doing in future. Thank you so much for joining us.